We took a break. We properly fed ourselves. <laughs> now we're here to talk movies we actually liked. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I just saw a list on Letterbox where it says films where Andrew Garfield goes up against a lizard man and he puts the amazing Spider-Man and the social network. <laughs> okay, all right. That's pretty funny. Oh, uh, pretty good, man. Pretty good. All right. Get all on right, Letterbox. So we're, doing, we're doing stuff. We're here we're for the doing. best of the year. We're here for the best of the year. It'll be a nice welcome reprieve from uh, yeah. the, the worst of the year. <laughs> that was that was that got rough. <clears throat> so uh, a few, uh, I think a few things I got to get out of the way before we get into this. First off, this list was hard. Yeah, this was this was really hard, and yeah. so there's a lot of movies I loved. I had to take off the list because there just mm-hmm. wasn't enough room. Mm-hmm. Um, and I. And in the same spirit of that, I forced myself to pick only one MCU movie uh, because I was guys like I wanted to make room for other other movies on the list because I feel like all three would have gone up there if I left it there. All I'm right. not gonna say which one made um, which one didn't make it right <clears> now, <throat> just so I you don't use process elimination. Uh, yeah, but yeah, that like I literally re- rewatched all three of them again just to like verify that i made what i feel is the correct choice you know the sad thing right now what's that i'm literally looking at my list right now and i'm like hmm <laughs> <laughs> you gotta make a change just do it now man <laughs> hmm. <laughs> not sure maybe no but maybe hmm. I know, it, this year was hard there's a lot of really good movies there was this was a very very strong movie uh, year for film yeah um i was really impressed by what came out um so right the and i was kind of torn between the whole thing of like you know entertainment value versus quality quality um so yeah, like, yeah. i kind of went down the middle on that like some of them were just kind of like, more entertainment versus uh like you know cinema uh um, yeah right there's also plenty of that on there too mm-hmm. uh so do you got any runners ups you want to go real quick uh, i got a few um so, do I, <clears> so go ahead <laughs> i have things like technically things that i would have uh, i was struggling to decide where they should go in relation to each other for example suicide squad and f9 because mm-hmm. both of them are just fantastically entertaining movies they're stupid they're fun they know they are but like they just had a great time. Yeah. Um, Malignant and Candyman. Candyman was like Candyman was you know, a tough one. It was it was a great horror movie. Um, and also did a lot of really. I, it was a great follow up to the legacy of the first one, I think. Um, and they pulled off a lot of things with it that were you know really tricky, and they they did it, I think. Um, but also Malignant, in my mind, kind of tied with that because not as much in terms of social commentary, but in terms of just being kind of a bonkers tribute to older horror films and doing its own crazy thing. Um, and then French Dispatch kind of sat on its own. It's just a delightful movie, but it wasn't yeah. like, it's one, of the, it's one of those things where, you know, a lot of my nines or tens, I have to be like, it's really subjective as to whether this is a nine or 10. Like, yeah, for sure. I don't know if I can fully recommend this to everybody, but it was this for me. Whereas French Dispatch is just a solid eight that I can't imagine anyone really hating. Yeah, I feel like it's a really hard movie to just go like, fuck this movie. Yeah, it's just <laughs> really enjoyable. It's a fun movie. It, I think um, the, review, like, the shortest review you made this year. It is like, it's yeah. like a delightful walk in the park. It's, it's like, how do we, how do we, there's not a lot to say about it. It's just a great movie. Go watch it. Yeah, um, and then uh, Eternals just barely didn't crack my list. Yeah, I'm like, again, I'm like, I'm going to keep my lip shield on the MCU stuff, but like, yeah. But I uh, man barely didn't make my list. Yeah, it's not even on my runner ups or my main list. So uh, Judas and the Black Messiah also barely didn't make my list. Yeah, Same with Candyman. Yeah. Um, and then of course the MCU stuff, which I'll talk about later. I'm guessing Ma Rainey's Big Black Bottom didn't make it into yours either. Well, that was last year. Oh, was it? I d- it did make the list back then. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. I was gonna say, why do you hate black people, Mike? <laughs> That was the exact criticism I was afraid of. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Um, but yeah, Eternals barely didn't crack mine. That was kind of a, a toss up. And yeah, uh, hard. And I rewatched yeah. it again recently. It's still really good. 
Well, that's the thing. There's some stuff on here that I did not enjoy as much as a couple of the runner-ups that I put up there, but there's just different levels of good they have to attribute to things. So, sure. you know, so, so on that note, why don't you start off with number 10? <sighs> One interesting thing about my list is that <clears throat> a lot of things about it are sequenced in terms of like my numerical rating and then mixing up the ones that had similar ratings. But um, I went back and forth on this, but in the end, I couldn't like leave it off the list entirely. Um, like it just, it, 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 it outpaced all of the runner ups, but at the same time, I couldn't rightfully put it above a lot of the other ones that are on here. And that is, <clears throat> Uh, Zack Snyder's Justice League. Okay, I had a feeling this was going to come up. And the, the thing about it is that, like, I know that it's not for everyone. I know not everyone jives with his particular brand of earnestness in filmmaking. I know there's a lot of, you know, drama surrounding the release of this movie and the lead up and the toxic fan base and concerns about what it would do to empower the toxic fan base, the aftermath of which we're already seeing in a couple of other situations. Um, but the fact that this was a, an example of an artist finally being able to manifest his vision after years of struggle with a studio that really took advantage of him and tried to fuck him over and put him down. And Joss Whedon recently came out with an article. Oh, God. Um, yeah. Which is, I don't think he understands how hard he fucking dunked on himself in that. Oh, my God. Um, but the way that he portrays what happened kind of only reinforces the kind of shit that like, he literally says that one of the things that, um, Gal Gadot had a criticism about him was about, he's like, oh no, she misheard me. She must not have understood me. You know, English isn't her first language. She yeah. probably just didn't understand the words that were coming out of my mouth. And uh, basically saying he believed that Ray Fisher was like secretly plotting with Zack Snyder to fucking bring him down and shit. Like, God, it just further feeds into the, the for me, an affirmation of just what a piece of shit he is. And um, being able to see what this was originally intended to be, even if it's not a lot of people's cup of tea, uh, was something I really enjoyed. I watched it twice. I'll probably watch it again. It's a four hour movie. Okay, but um, there is something, and I know a lot of people can't get over certain elements about it, like, you know, the way the Flash runs or whatever, but, or the soundtrack, you know, that doesn't really work for a lot of people. They want the huge orchestral, like, dun, 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 like, fine, I get that. I love Hans Zimmer too, but there is an earnestness and heartfelt core to this movie that really got through to me mm. and I could really feel how much he really cared about this movie and how sentimental he was about it mm -hmm. and whether or not someone has empathy for that will really be a huge factor in whether or not they like this movie at all um, but I was in for it and what I got out of it was uh, something that really did get to that core of people who felt like outsiders trying to fit in, trying to feel better about being human and trying to interact with people and help them in ways that they can, even if they can't really be themselves in a real way, mainly through the flash and through cyborg. I really loved what they did with cyborg. I love what they added. Um, I, I mean, I love what they restored from what Ray Fisher originally did. I love that plot line. Um, <clears throat> Joss Whedon literally said that like, we cut them out because they were bad and he's a bad actor. Yeah, I read that part. And um, I contest that it's one of the strongest parts of the movie. And it's the plot thread that brings it all together. And in a big way, it's the emotional core for the movie. And it, you know, Zack Snyder wanted to really give you know, give proper screen time to 
like a, one of the few times that a black superhero really gets to be at the forefront of a movie like this, especially a big ensemble movie like this, especially an actor like Ray Fisher, who doesn't have a big, um, you know, reputation or career yet um, to put him up front there with, you know, Gal Gadot and Ben Affleck and Jason Momoa, <clears throat> even Ezra Miller, like all of them have, are were more well-known than Ray Fisher. And he worked with him to write the script. He gave him a chance to shine. And I really enjoyed that side of the movie and that perspective on things. And I, it gets to me. It's, it's one of those things that keeps me emotionally engaged all the way through. And it's very rare for a four hour movie to do that. So I had to give this credit, like all hype aside, all of the stuff happening around it aside, uh, it is a much, much better movie than the original was. And I'm really glad that I got to finally see it. Mm -hmm. You know, on a certain level, that's there's a certain sense of justice just to that. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It lends a lot to it. <clears throat> my, my my stance on the Snyder <clears throat> stuff is more than clear at this point. I'm not gonna regurgitate anything. My stance on it nowadays, like if you liked it, okay, good for you. Like I'm not gonna try to take that away from you. I'm not What's your number it. 10, Michael? Uh <laughs> Uh, so we're like, just don't be a cultist about it. That's all I ask. That's really it's it. Not, yeah, fine. But what's? I'm not looking to get into all that crap again. I, that, that was literally my only statement on it. Calm, calm down. <laughs> uh, uh, my number 10 is actually a movie I was not expecting to put on here. I wasn't expecting to like as much as I did. I put Encanto on here. Oh, no shit. Yeah. Um, that's because like that's the movies that I kind of thought more about and rewatched it again when it came out on Disney Plus and all stuff is like, you know what? This is actually a really goddamn good movie, which is kind of funny considering how much shit I was giving Lin Manuel Miranda in the other video. Uh, but like, well, he he has songs in it. He didn't write and direct it, right? And he, he pretty much wrote all the songs, as far as I know. He wrote the songs, though. Uh, I don't. I feel like he's pretty heavily involved in the production. But I could be wrong. Mm, um, I'll look it up. But um, what's the verdict? I'm looking it up. Keep talking. Okay. okay. Um, but what this really works as as a as a really good modernization of the typical family message that Disney is used to producing, mm. and and that and it's much more nuanced. There is much more depth to it, um, and I feel like it's something that not really really res I think it's going to resonate with kids, but it also like oh. he is one of six writers of the story. Okay. And there were two screenplay writers that were not him. Got it. And there were two main directors and a third co-director. I don't know how that fucking works, but yeah. Yeah. Um, they were the people who wrote it. So, yeah, he may have done the music, but he wasn't, like, in charge Fair of the story. It wasn't that integral to the development. Got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> that, being that being said, I feel like it doesn't encapsulate what, like, what he tries to do with his films. Um, but it's also it's so interesting... Once you get past the first song of the movie, which is very much the exposition song, uh, which is like, here's the family, here's what everyone does, yada, yada, yada. And then you get to the, the second song on there, which is this kind of emotionally devastating song about just this woman who feels like that's literally carry the world on her shoulders and I hold all this <laughs> pressure for everybody else and maintain this positive imagery because that's just what her family expects of her. Um, and you watch like everyone who like who is that role in their family collectively watch that and just go, fuck. <laughs> All right. Because like you know like videos on TikTok and just people like reacting to that and just like watch it go, holy shit. <laughs> yeah. So like clearly it resonates, and I won't give too much away because I know you haven't seen it. Yeah, um, I definitely still want to. So I, I'll avoid giving it to spoilers. Um, but the but the conclusion and inevitably draws a uh, goes to. And um, what it does with that is, I think it's actually very, very nuanced. I think it's very natural progression of what Disney Animation is trying to do with the movies recently. And in my opinion, produces like honestly the best animated Disney movie they've done like close to a decade. I want to say, nice. Uh, like I would put this above Frozen. Um, I like, mean, like that. I mostly in that. That's everyone's like number one. It's not mine, but it's like what everyone else is. Um, and not mine. But either way, uh, really wonder wonderfully told, really like really good characters, really wonderful <clears throat> animation. 
good like the songs are catchy but they have a good emotional heart to them and the inevitable like antagonist part in there again without going to spoilers the way they handled that was i thought was really really interesting and really respectful um and definitely add like the, the main moral message being it doesn't matter if you're family if you're not dealing with your bullshit um which is like for a modern lesson for kids is something that i can really get behind and i like that that's where these lessons are going for as opposed to like you have to love them because there's our family um but this one's like no you don't <laughs> um you you can handle you can you can welcome to their family if they're willing to change and acknowledge their mistakes yeah um and also leave room for others to make mistakes and let leave them room to grow in their own way and not just how you imagine them growing um and i really like those scenes i think it's really good for kid lesson and to me that's very very encouraging to see that also good for representation also or um also just yeah gorgeous cultural piece um, so yeah, Encanto is my number 10. What are you looking up right now? Sorry, my dad just texted me. <laughs> you with that or? No, no, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. Well, if you do, just let me know. I can pause it. No, nah, we're good. Um, so number nine. So my number nine. Um, is. Come on. My number nine is The Night House. Okay. Um, this was one of those movies where I, I watched it initially and it was excellent. I really enjoyed watching it. It was very interesting. Um, it did a lot of interesting things with its metaphors and its story and its characters and their motivations. Um and it's an interesting take on the horror story. And there's that visual component of the movie, which if you haven't seen it, I don't want to spoil. Mm -hmm. But um, <clears throat> just a really fascinating way of having that kind of dreamlike entity, uh, you know, like antagonist kind of thing, you know? Yeah. I really appreciated how that was portrayed and visually expressed within the film and Rebecca Hall of course is as always just phenomenal everything like <laughs> she's perfect always just amazing um her her acting from top to bottom like we we can be talking vocally we can talking about physically like facial expressions all of it she nails it you really do believe her and her character going through this and <clears throat> as the movie progresses as she gets deeper and deeper into this mystery and it gets weirder and weirder because you're in her perspective and you don't know how reliable the narr narrator she is um the way that it uses this whole thing as a metaphor for grief and suicidal ideation um and just depression in general and the kind of fears that come with that i really really appreciated the fact that this movie made that a central um topic and a central theme and how it explored it and as i thought about it more as time went on um i just liked it more and more so it's it's a unique film for what it is i've never seen anything quite like it and I think there's a surprising number of movies this year that we can say that about. Oh yeah. So yeah, really love that. Okay. <clears throat> number nine uh, is the Suicide Squad. There you go. Um, very different change of pace, obviously. Um, but I think kind of kind of going back to your same about the Snyder Cut, it, it is kind of a miracle this movie exists. Yeah. When you consider the entire fucking roller coaster that it took to get here. Uh, between James Gunn, of course, being fired from Disney after far right <clears throat> extremists like pulled up some like tweets from ten years ago that he already yeah. apologized for and weaponized it, and then just had that backfire on them in every conceivable way. <laughs> between him getting the Suicide Sky Squad movie and the Peacemaker TV show, uh, which Snyder cultists have still not gotten over. Uh, <laughs> And then, of course, and then of course, he's going to do Guardians of the Galaxy three, uh, three, and all that stuff. So the fact this movie exists and exists in this as this bizarre, insane outing that just so completely understands 
exactly what genre it's in um, and knows how to play with like basically it's like having like all the action figures in the toy box and just kind of just smashing them together uh, where it's like well he's a shark man he's gonna eat this guy and he <laughs> this guy's gonna like he's gonna use his machine he's gonna go chop 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 really fast and he's gonna shoot him in the dick for no reason you know <laughs> kind of thing and then when they think all is done there's gonna be a giant starfish that comes in they're gonna go smash <laughs> So it's like shit like that. I just so admire how outlandish the movie gets and yet somehow completely works despite itself. It is uh, James Gunn using every trick he has learned in his Hollywood career in both doing like hard R cult films and doing like comedy comic films and just making this amalgamation of like every best impulse he has. And it's glorious. <laughs> I, I rewatched it again recently, and one of one of my favorite parts of the movie that's kind of low key in the middle of all of it is when they're all going to rescue Harley, mm-hmm. and they're just about to set their plan off and like shoot this fucking like housemaid in the second story window, and she's like, "Hi guys!" And they're like, "Wait, what? We had a plan!" And she's like, "To to rescue me? That's so sweet. I can go back inside, and you can do it if you still want." Like just. <laughs> <laughs> and it, like that's uh, the thing though because like it is this very brutal very violent film but then there's these little character moments yeah you kind of appreciate and it does them like, well like, and they're distributed well throughout the movie like uh <clears throat> Petra too has that fantastic scene with uh Taki Watiti mm-hmm. uh, where he said like you know like rat, like the right? climax yeah yeah like rats like, if rats have purpose so do we I was like oh <laughs> He says, she, yeah, as she's sending swarms of rats to go eat a star, giant starfish, but you know, yeah. uh, and it's looking like the Peacemaker show is doing the same goddamn thing. So I was like, God damn it, this man is too good for us. I still uh, need to, I still need to watch Peacemaker. I, I don't know how I feel about the concept of a show about that guy. Yes, that is like, <clears throat> I would say it's definitely the main focus. Yeah. It's, it is basically a gigantic redemption arc for that <clears throat> character. Mm. Um, but like in a way that makes sense. Mm. Okay. Uh, it's James Gunn. He, he knows what he's doing. Okay. All right. Um, it's all James about toxic masculinity and like... <clears throat> how that Wait, happens. did he like make the show or... He like wrote he like wrote the entire thing as far as I know. Oh, shit. Okay. Like he wrote and directed the first couple episodes, I think. Then maybe um, I will give it an actual shot. Yeah, so like he's he's very heavily like he came up with the idea while he was making the Suicide Squad. Yeah, because he thought John Cena had a lot more dramatic range and he gets credit for. Yeah, so he just wanted to get like a kind of a vessel to explore that. But yeah, right. Suicide cool. Squad, the Suicide that. Squad have to make that distinction. Yes, which is kind of annoying, but I it's one of those things I'm just going to let, let, let go. Whatever, it's fine. Um, but I appreciate any movie that presents Weasel just the way he is. <laughs> <laughs> just the sounds he makes, and I love that that's Sean Gunn. Like, just... no. <laughs> there's so many little touches, so many little tweaks to that film that I love, and then you can catch like, the rewatches, and it just makes it so good. They made Polka you know Dot that he Dan told his Alex. brother. You know that he told his brother, and his brother's like, "Can I play the weird weasel dude?" And he's like, "Fuck yeah, dude!" Like, just... <laughs> that's actually like one of like two or three <clears throat> characters actually plays in that movie. Uh... Wait, he plays multiple characters. Yeah, he's he also plays Calendar Man for like a blink and you miss it like camera. Oh shit, that's him. Oh fuck. Okay. Yep. <laughs> right uh, on. So yeah, I adore I adore the Suicide Squad. I love everything it does. I love everything it is, and I will gladly watch it again whenever possible. Right on. <clears throat> Number eight. <clears throat> All right, multiple watches. Good shit. That's the thing. There's stuff on here where I would not want to watch it again. Yeah, for sure. But I don't know. It's so hard to rate the rank things like this. Yeah, like I said, that's what made this year so goddamn hard because there's a lot of movies, like the, the the first four. I want to say are like movies that I can watch multiple times <clears throat> and perfectly fine. The other six, I want to say, it's like I might rewatch once or twice. <laughs> yeah. Um. All right. So my number eight. Is Nomadland really that low? Yeah, actually, that I, I swear it took a lot of fucking thinking to figure out what the hell I wanted to do with this. Um, and it was a lot of back and forth, trust me, of like what matters to me. 
but in the end when it came down to nomad land um it did something really empathetic and interesting mm -hmm. with its with with what it did like i still remember it's one of the more, more interesting inter like um interviews uh reviews that we did this year yeah because you can watch us during the interview discussing it or interview fucking you can watch us during the review discussing it and see us exploring its ideas and deepening our understanding of it and like discovering more of the richness of the film as we discussed it with each other yeah like we expected that review to go on maybe 20 minutes and it ended up being more than twice as long as that i think yeah i think it went on for like an hour give or take yeah no we really dug into that movie there was a lot more to say about it than we initially thought um there's just a lot of empathy in that movie and it gives a visibility to a certain kind of american that is every bit as valid as every other kind of american but it's it's a distinctive side of America that I think a lot of people forget about these days because everyone is lost in the idea of, you know, well, the traditional versions of hyper Americanism, whether you're talking about like a hyper capitalist or you're talking about um, people who want to own their own piece of land and work it for themselves and not be reliant on the government or anything. Um, these people are an even further version of that where they don't want to own any kind of land they just have their vehicle that they live out of and then they just go explore the country and work gigs and make money however they can and live their lives out on the open road and there's something like old school cowboy romantic about that mm. but also a lot of these people are out there because essentially on a certain level, they're homeless. Mm -hmm. The question is whether they're by choice or not living out of their vehicles, you know? And there's, they actually mentioned that in the movie, like someone refers to one of them as homeless and they get really offended, which I guess in a certain way makes sense because they are, they consider their vehicle their home, mm -hmm. but that's the idea of being a nomad, right? Yeah. It's, you're, that is your life. You have a moving home that goes with you everywhere. And um, there's a weird minimalism to it while also being kind of maximalist because some of them just cram so much stuff into their into their vehicles. Um, and there are certain people in the movie who are obviously real people. Yeah. You know, you do have Francis McDormand as the central character in the film. Um, and she is obviously an actress, but a lot of the other people in the movie are very real talking about their real experiences. Like this is a very real movie in a lot of ways. Yeah. And I appreciate that it gives that kind of visibility to that kind of mindset and doesn't really criticize it. Um, it just shows you them as people. And it was, I don't know, it felt like, it felt like a moderately stylized documentary yeah. in a way. I can definitely see that. About something that I have never really had a visibility into. And I really appreciated the extra layer of, weirdly by adding that extra layer of, um, of artificiality to it, mm -hmm. it made it easier to connect more deeply with other elements of the movie that were more real. Yeah. And I just think that's a really astonishing achievement. Like Nomadland is definitely an astonishing movie and it deserves to be seen by everybody. So, yeah. yeah. I'll talk more about that one a little later on. Yeah. Um, I like you got all these like super serious conversation topics to start. And I'm talking like, yeah, it's like a Suicide Squad. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in that- I'll bounce back and forth. <laughs> in, my, in that same vein, uh, my number eight is actually the Mitchells versus the Machines. Um, did you ever get a chance to watch that? Not yet. It's still on my list. Uh, I absolutely fucking recommend it. It's one. I, it's one of those ones I definitely force friends to watch if they're down for it. All right. Um, for one thing, the animation is top notch. The script is hilarious. Maybe the guys made like one of the writers of Gravity Falls, so there's a lot of that same similar humor in there. Hmm. Um, 
But when you get down to it, I just had also had kind of a weirdly personal experience watching this. Um, because like, <clears throat> the whole point of the, the character is, uh, by the way, you'll love this little detail. Um, the main character, Katie, is like this ultra fit, like weird film nerd who had kind of like struggled their own identity and just kind of does whatever goofball thing they have. She has, she makes like fan, like she makes like little fun, like, uh, uses her pug as like a cop character. So he's really like, I've I've seen, I've seen images of her in the pug. (laughs) Um, but I, so like, I think one of the lines in there, like it's made like B movie cop, uh, like B cop movie kind of thing. Just by like, I may be a dog. Boom. But I'm not rolling over. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's like pretty that. good that's pretty good uh but they actually somebody actually i don't know if it was someone who made the movie or not <clears> they <throat> actually made her a letterbox account uh like in character letterbox account where is it <laughs> look up katie mitchell you'll probably find it oh my um God. but the pics they went with on there are like shockingly accurate for what the character they portray in the movie like someone put a lot of time holy shit and I found it. into like making this weirdly specific <laughs> A young Katie Mitchell was bitten by a radioactive Dawn of the Dead DVD and became the film goblin that you see today. And since no one will write a fancy Criterion essay about me, I'll write one myself. You can't stop me from living my life, New York film elite. <laughs> but like, no, this is like this whole ass essay. Holy oh, yeah. shit. <laughs> they still put a lot of fucking work into it. Uh. 50 greatest films ever made. Topped by Portrait of a Lady on Fire, which I definitely am down with. Yep. Wow. So there's a lot of fucking effort into that. That's great. I will um, have to dig into this deeper. But what really, <clears throat> really set apart for me, because it's one of those things, like, for one, that was basically my childhood in a nutshell. Um, updated 19 days ago. It's still being updated. <laughs> um. But the part that, really, uh, first off, they also have some great commentary about Silicon Valley and all that stuff. Um, but the part that kills me is like, Den McBride plays the dad. And the whole like dynamic is basically just uh, him being like the old style, kind of like boomer, camper, like old school, kind of like man of the woods kind of, kind of stereotype, but they make it work. Um, but the part that always got me is the fact that the whole dynamic is that he doesn't quite understand what she does. And he has a really hard time adjusting to it. All right. And that causes like an alienation between their relationship. So a lot of the movie is kind of just them trying to learn to understand each other a little better. Um, to the point where like, I, this is slightly spoilerish, but very early on in the movie, he's like, she's going to film school and uh, she, like, he's kind of you know, doing like the whole, she's leaving the house. I don't know how to deal with that kind of emotional stuff. And at one point he says like, do you have a backup plan in case this doesn't work out? You know, that, that conversation. Um, and at one point, and then one point he says like, look, just like the, the world hurts kid or something like that. And he says it kind of like a, like a well-meaning way, but then he gets that line throw back at him later through like something she made. And he visibly mm-hmm. like kind of winces. Um, and it's like that kind of just that weird kind of emotional empathy and mixed with like actively trying to understand each other while no one's necessarily right. And the way they kind of like learn to actually come back, kind of like what I was talking about the Canto, which is like it's actually about learning from each other and learning to respect each other as individuals and recognizing that you grow up, you can grow apart, but you can still come back together in some ways. You, nice. you, are, you are very distracted by something right now. <laughs> Her review of the Mitchells versus the Machines. <laughs> this is, I'm gonna go full Paul Schrader on this and rate my own movie five stars. Also, why isn't this listed in documentary? Got to talk to the mods. <laughs> yeah, I really need to go into this. This is um, yeah, you would like. I need it. to. I need to. I need to dig into this. I need to watch the movie, and I need to check out what the fuck this whole thing is because it's <laughs> someone Trust put me, a lot of effort watch into the movie. Dude. You go back to that. You will hear it in her voice because it is spot on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are only three technically reviews, but there are lists with a lot of notes in them. So, yeah, very yeah, nice. Don't spend like a shit ton of time getting that, getting the voice just right. It's actually really impressive. Um, yeah. But it's one, it's a movie that I very, I very personally resonated with. It affected it, to me, touch on the very personal things. Like, it's to the point where I want to show it to my parents 
and just be like, see? <laughs> this... Under under her website on the on the site, mm-hmm. it lists just one long word. Katie Mitchell used to have a website until her meal plan expired and she had to make some tough choices.com. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm sold. Good shit. I'm saving this for later. I thought you'd appreciate that. Pull my list back up. There we go. (laughs) All right. But yeah, Mitchell's Machines. I loved it. It's hilarious. It's heartfelt. It hit me very personally. Um, And it is the case, like, especially, again, I always bring this back up every time there's a parental thing in a movie, but especially with my dad, I wish I could, like, show him those clips. It's like, See, this is what you sound like, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I loved it. I watched multiple times. I've gotten other people to watch it. They cried too. So mm-hmm. it's like, okay, so it's it is a wonderful film, and I cannot recommend it highly enough, especially if you're a film nerd. Yeah. All right. I will check it out. Okay. So number seven. Number seven for me is Benedetta. That's actually my number six. So. Really? All right, let's talk about it. Yeah. Um, I holy shit! I fucking love this movie. <laughs> it was nonsploitation. Yep. I I just I really was like we were both surprised by just how fun this movie was. Yeah, and how deep it went into it too. Like, yeah. Uh, like we, we kind of saw. I kind of went just going to like. All right, it's a guy who made a RoboCop making a movie about horny nuns. Let's see where this goes. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's also made like a bunch of other movies that are a little more substantial, but like, of course, yeah, but that's like what he's known for. I, I, I really do appreciate his talent for making a movie that is just eminently watchable and entertaining. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. And I, uh, with with all of the actual commentary going on in here, um. You know, you could make a point of like, you know, there's so much nudity in this movie. Yeah. Um, but it is it is so much that it is and so casual mm-hmm. that it kind of crosses a line over from just being like there's a way that mo- most American movies approach nudity where like it's this hidden like oh i saw a titty kind of thing yeah. here there's just, like full frontal bitch like <laughs> we're just gonna yeah, have like French. a full-blown <laughs> sex scene we're just gonna like we're just gonna casually throw around nudity um and it almost allows you to get past that initial thing that a lot of movies do where the nudity is the point in a way where like it's this kind of coveted reward kind of thing for titillation and it crosses the boundary into where nudity is just an element of the storytelling Mm -hmm. and they really do use it to kind of push it as this anti-church thing yeah and as the movie progresses i found it really fascinating how it really plays back and forth with the notion of how much she was manipulating the church for her own benefits and how much she might actually be a prophet of sorts, maybe? Yeah, they kind of leave it ambiguous in terms of like whether I don't think they do. I I think you can make an argument either way, I think. Sure, I Um, I think they don't. I I think it's pretty clear, personally. I don't know. um, Either way, it is is definitely kind of interesting to see like whether how much she believes her own hype, so to speak. mm -hmm. Um, and how much she's just kind of playing up the crowd. Yeah. Uh, you can I mean, the work. power definitely corrupts her as it progresses. Yeah. But the way that it uses the story um, and the events in it to propel this kind of fucking insane story, like it goes from being yeah. this yeah, power really struggle cool. to being something genuinely like, what the fuck is <laughs> happening? Um, <laughs> And of course, like sexy Jesus, um, which has a point in the in the plot of the film in terms of you know discussing chastity and the church, and uh, also the whole idea of gender within the whole concept of you know Christianity and the church in general. So yeah. um, it does a lot with the themes that it plays with, and I it's, and at the same time manages to be really fun. Yeah, like, in a weird way. There's, there's literally a scene early in the film where <laughs> you get like 
there's a farting nun like oh, yeah. there's there's nuns farting in there like it's <laughs> and they're just blatantly like oh, oops <laughs> like, just, it's it's immediately crass and fun and weird and still manages to elevate itself and, and not become like those base elements and i just it's it's a really incredible achievement what they did with this movie yep. no and not only just a scathing indictment of the catholic church as a whole mm -hmm. and just about like faith and religion what actually does that mean in terms of also the theme of like exploring your own sexuality and sexual impression um and just like how those things should be embraced in the hands of god kind of thing um in in some cases quite literally uh god yeah. gave you titties enjoy them like just <laughs> <laughs> please don't carve my son into a dildo as always <laughs> is that so much to ask you guys take it too far <laughs> uh it's like I was actually wasn't... watching a video the other day where it's like uh, God and an angel and talking about like the creation of sins and angel comes down there and is like so I have like the newest self-imposed rules they gave themselves. I don't know why they, they call them sins. <laughs> it's like one was like don't uh, thou shalt not kill. Okay yeah that tracks that makes sense. Uh, and it's like thou shalt not covet other people's wives. What? Why? What? Like what if they covet you back? <laughs> <laughs> Like, uh, why is it a sin to have game? Is what God says. Why? Why am I imagining this guy as H. John Benjamin's voice? I mean, it's kind of not that far off. Uh, <laughs> yes, I would love to see a show with H. John Benjamin as God. That would be really great. But there's the part where he's like, and uh, oh, this can't be right. Master, it just says masturbation. It's like, what? Why? Like, I gave that as like a gift. <laughs> enjoy. <laughs> like, enjoy. Like, not too much, but you know, like. Have fun. <laughs> <laughs> Shit's hard. Just let off some steam, buddy. Well, that's actually. I was like, do you know? I they know how hard it is to get laid. That's partially my fault. I kind of made it weird about it. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to send me that. Whatever that is. <laughs> yeah, that sounds fun. fun. Um. But yeah. Anyways. But you know, Benedetta uh, is as like as much as we joke about it in like the just the very 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 horny parts about it. Um, it is still like a genuinely deep and thought provoking film. Yeah, and also the horny parts kind of have a point. Yeah, like the nudity, the nudity doesn't exist for its own merit. It does serve a larger yeah. narrative purpose, even if it is definitely a little exploitative. Um, yeah, but like it, I love how the horniness of the movie is in part, in and of itself, its own rebellion against the church. Like the movie is made to just be two giant middle fingers to the church. As, it's as kind of I was floored by how blatantly and gleefully it did that and I really enjoyed it yeah so Benedetta for a lot of fun uh, yep. and Good times. exactly what I said in the review horny nuns I'll make you think mm -hmm. nunalingus <laughs> <laughs> All right. I still laugh that like in the beginning of the movie, like when they're having like this little wooden statue of Jesus, and you say, "If they carve that into a dick, I swear to God." <laughs> like, yeah, it's, what was then, it? Like, it was it was, it was, later, it was even Mother Mary. It was even worse oh, than Jesus, Mary, the Virgin Mary. Mary. Yeah. They carved the Virgin Mary into a dildo. <laughs> uh, I wasn't even like, I swear to God, he's like, "That's gonna go inside someone." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "If they do that, I swear." This movie is like top of the year list, and it is so. <laughs> but not just because of that. Not just because of that. No, but it I got happen. higher standards. That was a joke, but it just happened to work out that way. Anyway, all right. So, so um, my number, my seven. number six. Yeah. So like technically that was your number seven. I just having my number six. The rest of it was covered at the same time. All right, you got your number seven, and yeah, then so I'll I got not my yeah. number seven. Gotcha. Uh, this is where I put Shang Chi as my number seven. Oh, interesting. Um, and I have to, I have to kind of explain why because I I this is when I definitely went back and forth on more than a few times because uh, I I just I recently rewatched Spider Man in theaters I rewatched Eternals I rewatched Shang Chi in that order just kind of was like is this the right place I don't know what to think and like I really really loved Spider Man I really really enjoyed it but the more I thought about it it's like this is a really fun entertaining movie but it does rely a lot on nostalgia mm -hmm. uh, which like by design that's not necessarily bad. Yeah, uh, it is exactly what it intended to be. Yeah, 
And so yeah. like, it's not bad, but it does, but like for me, it's more like, Hmm. Okay. So how much was because of quality and how much of it is just because it hits that nostalgia button. Um, so that was like kind of the internal structure there. Eternals, a uh, gorgeous film, very personal, very emotional film that still holds up on a second viewing. Um, but it just, there's just something that just wasn't quite there as much as I loved it. Uh, Shang-Chi definitely kind of hits all of those buttons. Uh, it's a fresh and new character. They did a fantastic job kind of building him up and making him stand on his own. The action scenes are kind of fresh and invigorating and have kind of like that Jackie Chan kind of vibe to it. Um, at least for the first half of the film. It still hits like the more traditional MCU beats, like Aquafina's there and how much you like her will be at varying degrees. Uh, Is it on Disney Plus for just streaming? It's on Disney Plus, yeah. All right, I'll have to check it out now that I can do it without paying for it. Yeah, right. Um, but it's so like how much you enjoy her over your own degrees. But what it really lands on, what I think what it really puts it on top of my list is the relationship between Shang-Chi and the Mandarin. Um, who is played by, I know it's an extremely well-known like uh, act like uh, Chinese action star. I'm blanking on his name. Help me out here. Uh, I think you should do like American films. Tony Lung Chuai? Yeah, that's him. I don't think I've seen him in anything. Uh, you can ask Chris about him. He was the one that did it. He's, he, he's a big deal, apparently. Um, I know. He's been in like Wong Kar Wai movies and stuff. I can see that from here. Oh, he was in Infernal Affairs. Oh, shit. Yeah. Very, very well known wow. action star. But the way, the, the way they produce him and. Uh, his relationship with uh, Shang Chi like is easily right. the emotional core of the film, and <clears> they <throat> really do a fantastic job exploring like the yes. that. <laughs> they bring Kent Ben Kingsley back as Trevor Slattery. Ah, oh, spoilers, but yeah, he's back in there. <laughs> uh, he's he's on the fucking cast list. I was looking up, and I was like, oh hell yeah! Because you mentioned the Mandarin, and I'm like, wait, I thought the wasn't that in Iron Man three? Are they fucking retconning something? And then I saw well, he they retconned like, it ages oh, ago yeah. when they did like the Thor two short, like Hail to the King, where they had was like, oh, he wasn't the real Mandarin. The real Mandarin's pissed at Trevor Slattery for impersonating him. Um, oh. So they've been setting this up for years, and they finally delivered. Now they actually had a good script, cool. uh, and it, it delivers. Like the the way they use the ten rings, uh, the way they kind of engage in those dynamics, and the way they play around with it is a lot of fun. But what really boils down to is it's one of those rare action films like this where the action itself informs the characters hmm. um, and the relationship with each other. Hmm. And a lot of the character arcs they have, you can tell by the way they move their bodies and the way they engage with each other in these action sequences. And it turns like half, uh, half like Jackie Chan action movie and half like hardcore Chinese fantasy in the second half. Um, and the way it all comes together is just deeply fascinating. It's great to see like an almost an entire Asian cast in this film. Uh, and I get that level of representation in there. It's nice to see that it get popular and get to see, get rec- the proper recognition deserves. Yeah. And see all those elements <laughs> together. And it's a genuinely fantastic fucking movie. I still loved how much fun he was having online with all of that. <laughs> What what? With the uh, just um him interacting with uh when the internet, for example, found all the pictures of him in stock photos. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and he was just like posting posting some of them on his Instagram and being like, here's Shang-Chi just chilling out and see at a yoga class before he goes off to fight this monster, like some shit like that. The funny part is he actually used to do what I do on weekends, uh like doing like birthday parties and stuff as Spider-Man. So <laughs> And I'm kind of thinking, it's like, yes, there's hope for me. Um, <laughs> but no, like, they really do have a fantastic relationship. It's a, And they don't, they give the Mandarin a very good characterization as well. They don't make him just additional, like, I want power. They make him just this broken man who is trying to basically buy his family back together mm-hmm. in a way that I won't spoil. But it's, right. it's, it's definitely, it's, it is a good case for abusive parenting and abusive fathers and who like want to be the good father, but have no abil- actual ability to. Um, and the way they try to basically buy love through like some big grand gesture um, that they think is going to fix everything. And the way they explore that dynamic is really fascinating, really in surprisingly deep. Um, and then of course it ends in a big MCU finish. <laughs> then again, I won't, I won't spoil it, but um uh, yeah, Ben Kingsley is also great. 
are the scenes he's in. He tends to be. And he's having a great fucking time doing it. Uh, apparently when they called him to ask if he wanted to come back as Trevor Slattery, um, he act- he actually like answered in character. Nice. Or like I said, like, oh, hold on, let me ask. And he has like his whole off phone conversation with himself as Trevor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he picks the phone back up. I was like, Trevor says he'll do it. Uh, <laughs> so like, all right, respect. All right. And well, they also make dumbass characters like Razor Fist work. And I just kind of love that. Just on principle. All right. I'll have Razor to check Fist, that, Dumbest Marvel characters. Like, what's your power? I got sword hands. <laughs> well, I mean, Wolverine. <laughs> I know, but like this, like he has like all like healing, like healing factor and all stuff. This guy's like, I lost both my hands. And instead of like putting amputees on there, I put swords. <laughs> they kind of make it work in a phenomenal bus action sequence. But yeah. Whoa. The, the fucking director of uh, Short Term 12 and Just Mercy. Oh, is he the director of Shanti? Yeah. Crazy. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Intense. So that's my number seven. We are in through my number six, so you go do your number six. Right on. All right. Sorry, I'm just like doing little dives on the side into these things that you're bringing up, and I'm like, oh, damn, more cool shit I have to watch. God damn it. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. How dare you? I rec- I like recommend things you should enjoy. All these good wrecks, you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> fucking asshole giving me cool shit to watch. Like my fucking watch list isn't long enough. Oh. But these are actually like fun. They won't make you depressed at the end. <clears throat> I don't know where I put my list now. Okay. But I remember what it was. I'll bring it up. Um, my... Uh, my number six for the year is The Father. Only number six? Huh? Yeah. Okay. Um, the Father... Um, I mean, you remember I texted you after I came out of this movie. Yeah. I, I think it was one of those that we were just going to let slip by. Um, until I just decided to go watch it because I read something online that was like, this movie's fucking amazing. I've never seen anything like it before. And I'm like, all right, sure. And um, I'm always a fan of uh, Olivia Coleman and Anthony Hopkins, of course, but um, just something when I, when I left the movie, just there was this feeling mm-hmm. and I, couldn't quite process it and it brought up a lot of feelings for me uh in regards to like a lot of personal family shit and i just went and like i didn't even get in my car i just went and i stood by my car and i took out a cigarette and i just fucking stood there smoking and thinking and i just texted you like you need to see this yeah I can't tell you anything about it, but you need to see it and we need to talk about it. And so you did. (laughs) And then you texted me after you got out and you were like, okay, I see what you mean. (laughs) Like, I don't even know what to say. I'm kind of just processing. I'm like, yeah, take your time with that. Yeah. Um, and then we sat down for one of our most personal fucking reviews we've ever done. Yeah. We unloaded some dirty laundry in that fucking video whatever um <laughs> that, that wasn't an admonishment that was more just a yeah yeah I, I actually fucking love that review kind of for that reason yeah no it, it was it was really it's it's a testament to what this movie brings out in people yeah um and <sighs> there's just a lot that this movie covers and it is a complex movie ethically um the father is by and large an unlikable character oh yeah but at the same time as the movie progresses and it becomes sort of a weird horror movie along the way Mm -hmm. i don't want to like spoil what it's about yeah but the way that it develops is such a fascinating way to introduce um 
a measure of compassion Mm -hmm. and kind of terror into it. Mm -hmm. Um, Not to mention, you know, like the asshole fucking boyfriend and everything. And like, just, it, 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 it doesn't make it easy. Absolutely. It introduces a difficult concept and difficult relationship dynamics and a difficult character to empathize with and then just expands upon that concept and really just, it was riveting. It was riveting and terrifying. And at the very end, I just broke. Yeah. Fucking broke me. And, um, I gotta say, I have a lot of respect for a movie that can break me. Um, but the way this movie did it and what it did it about and how it resonated with me personally regarding my personal life and my feelings towards certain family members, um, quite a towering fucking achievement for a movie. Absolutely. Um, honestly, now that I'm talking about it and thinking about it, I might have put it a couple spots higher up on my list, but we'll talk about it again. It makes you feel better. Uh, huh? We'll talk about it again. It makes you feel better. Oh, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, I might have at least switched it with the next thing up on my list, but you'll understand that too. Yeah, I'm sure I will. Uh, so we were in over my number six of Benedetta. Yeah. I also dropped down to number five. <laughs> um, right. Okay. So should I just do my number five? Then? Number five. Yeah. Okay. All right. So my number five was Writers of Justice. Okay. Um, and the reason that I put it higher than the father is that, I mean, one, I had a better time watching it (laughs) and I would probably rewatch it more readily, but in terms of something that was useful to me, Mm -hmm. um, there is something beautiful about writers of justice when it comes to confronting feelings of grief and lack of acceptance and, how to process bad things that have happened. And, you know, that whole thing that you brought up during the review about the wall of photos, um, the way that it goes about its themes and the, and the conclusions that it arrives at are just really elegant and beautiful and kind of sweet in a weird way. Yeah. Uh, while also being a pretty entertaining movie. Yeah. And it was pretty, uh, it was kind of a wild ride. Oh yeah. Uh, and I just really enjoyed what it did. Um, I don't really have a lot more to say about it without digging deep, mm-hmm. but uh, I think we explored those themes pretty well in our review of it, even though we like spoiled the first 20 minutes of the movie during it. But the first 20 movies, uh, 20 minutes is seriously like the setup for the whole movie. So it's not yeah, that big of a thing. One pissy ass commenter. <laughs> sure. Um, but overall, just really surprising and great movie yeah. um, with a lot of heart and Absolutely. some really nice things to say. And I really appreciated that. It resonated with me in a way that I still really enjoy, which is why compared to the father, which just kind of haunted me, uh, <laughs> I just felt like this deserved to be a little higher on the list. So fair enough. Uh, my number five in that same vein, I'm just going to guess is going to be higher on your list. Mm. Um, Titan is my number five. Yeah. Um, actually, you're actually a big part of why this movie is this high on this list, honestly. Really? Because uh, okay. you, you, you were very helpful in contextualizing uh, this film in terms of what it is and what it's trying to do and how it's speak and what it's trying to say with its, oh, thanks. let's call it unusual trappings. Uh, have you watched, um, have you watched it again since? No, uh, I honestly, because I remember it pretty vividly, which is uh, like. Watch like, it again. Okay. Watch it again. It is a very different experience the second time through because you know what to expect. The first time a lot of the movie is shaped by what to expect and what not to expect. The second time when you know what is or is not coming, it allows you to focus on completely different elements of the movie and this much more human element behind it Mm -hmm. just becomes the absolute forefront of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Like all the stuff that was kind of suspenseful and weird the first time around kind of takes a backseat to just how yeah it's it's great highly recommend rewatch at some point okay um but for my experience with it and grant i'm coming from a very different place yeah um is the fact that 
considering just how bad shit the concept is generally, you think it'd be very easy for it to get very cynical or mm-hmm. very just exploitative or like shock value. Like, oh, here's this crazy thing that's happening. But it honestly resists the urge to do that, mm-hmm. uh, especially towards the second half of the film. The second half yeah. of the film was very restrained and it's and it very character focused and very mm-hmm. emotion focused in playing with these things of just identity and self-presentation and expression and literally hiding yourself um, and all these complex things that I'll straight up say I don't fully understand. Um, I'm I would like to, but I'm like I'm not gonna sit here and pretend I understand it beginning to end. Mm. Um, but again, man, I need to need to watch it. But I, I I think the more I've thought about, it, the more I reflect on it, the more I can recognize the beauty within it. Uh, yeah, that it's using these again kind of crazy ideas to tell a very human story. Um, and I think any movie that can do it in a way that not only just like works narratively, but actually leaves a deep last impact that you think about long after the credits roll, I think is wildly impressive. I have a feeling it's going to be a lot higher on your list. Um, um, yeah, this is honestly, Titan is, the, especially after the second viewing, Titan is one of my favorite movies that I've ever seen. Yeah, I, kind of, um, I, had, I had a feeling it was going to be yeah. out there for you. But for me, it's my number five. <laughs> yeah. All right. So number four. Yep, number four. Matrix Resurrections. All right. <laughs> I had a feeling this was going to come up. Because <laughs> I, okay, let's be real. Um, this was where I had to make a distinction because clearly, you know, something like Nomad Land is <gasps> more Oscar worthy kind of deal. Yeah. Um, and Benedetta gets deeper and darker, but in a way, um, I actually had a very interesting thing where I felt like in a way Matrix Resurrections and Zack Snyder's Justice League should be tied. Yeah, I can see that. Because they have this weird, like, overly earnest, batshit, like, self-indulgent, combat-focused, like, it, they're very self-indulgent movies. And oh, yeah. I appreciate them both for that. Uh, but at the same time, when I separated them, they had to be this far apart on the list simply because... The Matrix Resurrections is such a personal film. It is. Um, it is. It is almost autobiographical. Yeah. And the way that Lana Wachowski used this to express her feelings about, you know, things like transition and everything. And that's the thing. Like, a lot of people just look at it on a surface level and they see that it's messier. It's not as elaborate in terms of special effects. It's not going to revolutionize everything. But that's the point. I really appreciated the fact that after all of this stuff that they could have done with it at the heart of it, the matrix resurrections is just a love story. Mm -hmm. And in a way it's recontextualizing the concept of the matrix to essentially be the love story of a trans woman rescuing herself from the evil clutches of societal trappings. Yeah. And when you, are aware of that metaphor. When you think about it under that guise, I really love how this reclaimed that concept, mm-hmm. of the whole concept of the Matrix, to not only tell this really beautiful metaphor for being your true self, no matter what anyone says, and the power that that unlocks within you. Um, you know, I've heard of like the concept of gender euphoria, which is something that trans people experience after they transition and they're finally able to be themselves for the first time ever um but on top of that being able to so cleverly be as meta as it is the references it makes to its own legacy the references it makes to itself as a franchise and itself as an entity within this new movie slash matrix thing and (laughs) just how funny it is <laughs> just i fucking one of one of the happiest moments in any movie this year was when he went into his boss's office at the game studio and there's the fucking bust of, of fucking smith getting slow motion punched in the face from the third movie <laughs> that that makes me so happy dude and as someone who loves the entire original trilogy unironically for different reasons for each movie. Um, I love how this one managed to strike 
such an amazing balance between um between the tone of the first three movies it manages to be faithful to the legacy while also still being its own thing entirely being something new and just being something really heartfelt and it is 100 percent top to bottom a wachowski movie oh yeah shamelessly gloriously and i fucking love it I love it so much. Honestly, this movie I've come to respect more and more and more. I've thought about it. Just like, you yeah. know what? Love it or hate it. It is unabashedly its own thing. And yeah. you have to respect it for that. Um, if you haven't watched it yet, go check out the Renegade Cuts. Um, uh, the Renegade Cut did a video on it. I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a great video. Oh, it is? Um, yeah. I, and I highly recommend it to anyone who hasn't seen it. But it also, even though I caught on to a bunch of the stuff in the movie, it also highlighted a couple of things in the movie that I had not caught on to, and it just yeah. made me appreciate it more. So, um, yeah, a staggering achievement, really. All right. So, number four. Uh, my number four is uh, Pig. No shit. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, this is kind of the movie that came out of nowhere. Uh, or at least, like, the trailer promised something entirely different than what we got. The trailer yeah. definitely played up like the it's Nicolas Cage, he's a ragged old hobo, and someone took his pig. Uh, so, so he's gonna go on a path of revenge to get his pig back. And what we got was this really somber, uh, introspective, emotional think piece that's Meditative honestly one of drama. like Nicolas Cage's best yeah. performances in years. <clears throat> Um, and ha- to this day is a scene I've gone back and I've watched just this one scene from beginning to end so many times. One of the restaurant. At it every single time because it is like this is the most perfect scene <laughs> I have seen since doing this show. There is literally no flaw to a single line <laughs> delivery, frame, glance, bodily mo- motion. There is nothing wrong with this scene. Nice. Uh, you know what I'm. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, I know which one. If you've seen the movie, you know what it is. Oh shit, my camera died. Hold on. Um, but yeah, so like, and then it's just that. Do like, you want to just pause for a second while you fix your camera? Hold on. Okay. <laughs> there, there you go. go. Um, um, but yeah, just I like in the way, the way that it expresses humanity and empathy and understanding within people. <clears throat> And how you connect that to food um, is the way that I think is just so impressive. And the way it just has these s- small little character moments uh, or just like, or sometimes even going nowhere. Like Chin's grabbing somebody's bike, even Nicholas Cage grabbing somebody's bike and they go, hey, Nicholas Cage goes, ah! It's like, okay, you can have the bike. <laughs> just, I forgot like that. that part. <laughs> It was pretty good. But the, the, the way they humanize everybody and the way, like, g- given the fact that what this movie could have been and the restraint it has and the humanity it has and the compassion it has um, for everyone involved, I just, I found this movie deeply touching. Um, and, I, and I really fell in love with it. Uh, which is, again, it, it is not what I expected, but in the best possible way. Mm. Right on. I respect that. Absolutely. I had a lot of debate on whether or not to add it to my list. So I take it and make yours. I'm not telling. Uh, okay. Fair enough. Well, on that note, what's your number three? Number three for me is Dune. Okay. Yeah. This was inevitable. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> well, fucking d- d- dismiss me. Fucking I'm dismissing you. I'm <laughs> You're like, of course it was. Um, okay. I of course, see, Dune's I can, on his list. I, I can see how that sounds. I apologize. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, Dune. I'm a huge Denis Villeneuve fan. I've been for quite a while, ever since I caught on, on Sundays in theaters. Um, I was really excited when Sicario came to theaters and he got a lot of recognition. I was even more excited when Arrival came to theater and theaters and he got like hugely blew up. I'm a huge fan of Blade Runner 2049. You can see from our longest review ever for that movie. And um, that beaten by, I think it might have been beaten by the Rise of Skywalker. 
was it beaten by well yeah that's that's those are the polar opposites the love and the hate like yeah, ultimate okay. love ultimate hate <laughs> um mostly both just filled with me ranting um but the whole story of how dune happened is like almost in the same vein of the insanity of what it took to make Zack Snyder's Justice League happen because this was a part one of two and if it didn't make its money back it wasn't going to get a part two yeah. and this has been Denis Villeneuve's dream project for ages it's been a lot of people's dream project for ages and I knew he was going to do it right um, and then pandemic happened and he was like don't you fucking release my movie on HBO, you pieces of shit. Don't you fucking do it. You're going to fucking kill his whole franchise before we're able to do anything. And he fought for it. He publicly went out, bit yeah. the hand that fed him and like started a movement of directors to get this shit done. And <laughs> holy shit, he fucking did it. And he got it delayed another year. And we got to see it in theaters when, you know, it was somewhat safe for a while. Um, like a hot minute there. But oh, I was mesmerized by this movie, just top to bottom. First time I watched it, I felt a little like weird about some of the tonal choices, but overall just adored it. Second time I watched it, I was in. And I literally watched this movie in every kind of theater I could. I watched it in IMAX. I watched it in Dolby. I watched it in... Uh, centuries xd theaters i even do did the finally did the xb xdd box seats the ones that rumble and move and i can finally verify they suck ass um <laughs> they're hilariously bad and disruptive to a film going experience um i watched it in 3d uh, <laughs> i watched it in the big big imax three times um overall i watched this movie 12 times in theaters yeah Jesus Christ. um over the course of like three months or even no two months um it there's something about it that just feels comfortable for me mm -hmm. it's such a rich world every single frame of the movie is so gorgeously constructed the score is so immersive the lore is so beautifully explored and developed over the course of the film um that every time i watch it it just feels like its own little vacation it is escapism at its finest for me mm -hmm. and it hits that beautiful sweet spot of tone where it's exciting where it needs to be but it's not so exciting that i'm like adrenaline pumped it just feels like i'm watching something epic whether it's one of the quieter moments where it's just character moments or it's one of the bigger, grander scale moments. And uh, I really appreciate that tone. Yeah. And I know some people didn't like it that much in terms of, you know, the, the way that the pacing was or anything, but the more I watched it, the more I was okay with it. Mm -hmm. And it got to the point where I've seen it this many times because we have the, the Stubbs A-list. Yeah. So I don't have to think about whether or not I'm spending $20 to go see a movie in a fancy theater I can just be like, I'm not doing anything tonight. I'm bored. Like, oh, hey, there's a showing of Dune. Like, yeah. I'm just going to go watch Dune. It's going to be nice. And I go and sit in the theater. I'll be like, yeah, this is nice. And I just really enjoyed it. It felt almost like home in a way. Yeah, It was weirdly soothing to experience. And at this point, I could just watch it over and over. And I'm really, 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 really fucking pissed off at the home release. Because if you got the chance to see it in theaters, especially in IMAX theater, um, especially if you're lucky enough to live close to one of the big, big IMAX theaters, which gave you the full one nine, like the, the full three, four frame. Mm -hmm. The fact that the home version of it is the 2.35 ratio mm -hmm. cuts out such a massive amount of the picture. Like they could have just gone like something that's closer to 16 by nine and I would have been fine, but they, they made it super wide screen. So it's like this big instead of this big, when in reality, the actual picture is this big. And I got so used to seeing this that I can't really watch it at home. 
it's it's like the scenes that come up the scene where you see the worm come out of the like it's like just hovering over paul and um in in the big theater you could see the whole fucking worm on the home release you literally see like maybe half of it Uh, it's crazy how much it cuts out and I don't know, maybe I'll get used to it. Maybe the, I, they fucking better release the full fucking frame version in some way, or at least an expanded frame version that retains the IMAX stuff. Because if they can do that for the Dark Knight, why can't they do it for fucking Dune? Yeah, right. um, but yeah, I don't understand why it's stuck the way it is. I really hope we get a proper release of it. Um, but as it stands, I'm really happy I got to see it in theaters the way I did. Um, and I really hope that you know, I hope that when the second part comes out that they'll do a re-release of the first part so that we can do like the double feature and I will just go to that over and over and over while I can. Because <laughs> um, yeah. it's just comforting for me. Yeah, and cool. aside from how good the movie is, there was some part of it that I was thinking about to figure out why it resonates so much with me. Mm-hmm. And I realized that for all of the conflict that it had, um, the way that it portrays the family dynamic in it mm-hmm. is one of my favorite portrayals of family um, that I have seen in a movie ever. Um, there's something about the way that um, God, I forget what Paul's father's name is, but um, the way that his father the Dilf. expresses, huh? Is it the Dilf? I mean, it's Oscar Isaac. How can you not? But um, sorry. <laughs> but the way that he embodies a certain kind of masculinity is kind of amazing. Mm-hmm. It's very rare that you see a genuinely healthy leader in movies. Um. I don't think that he's like, he's almost flawless, which in its own way is kind of weird, but the, the kind of masculinity that he embodies, it's confident. It's a real leader. It is supportive. It it is, it has standards, but it also has faith and love for the people that he trusts. It's strategic in other ways. Um, It's never hurried, uh, but and it has its flaws because, of course, the movie goes the way it does. But course, yeah. the, the way that he is a man within this movie is such a fascinating portrayal of masculinity. And the way that that is reflected in the way that he is a father to Paul is really beautiful. I really love the connections that they have. I really love that Paul straight up says at one point, like, what if I can't be the next leader of this massive fucking empire that we've built? And he says, if you say no, then that's your choice and it's fine, but I'll still love you because you're my son. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't need you to be anything but my son. And that like, fuck, man, that gets to me. Like, that's yeah. how many movies have a dynamic like that that is so natural and unsentimental. It's not like really honing in on it and trying to be a tearjerker about it. It's just very calmly saying like this is what this is this is how they are and the dynamic between him and his mother is similar she is torn between these two loyalties between her family and house atreides and uh you know the bene and the bene Gesserit. Yeah. and throughout the movie you see this push and pull between these loyalties and the fact that she is anticipating like her son is turning out to be the prophet that she believes that he would be and has been training him to be. But at the same time, she knows the difficulty that lies inside of that for him and how painful that path is going to be for him. And it's, it's heartbreaking for her. She really struggles with it throughout the movie. She's terrified. She doesn't know if they're going to survive um the trials and tribulations that he's going to go through on his way to becoming a prophet and at the same time she loves him but she knows that she's the one putting him through this but she also worries about him like it's such a it's such a difficult balance to strike 
And the way that Rebecca Ferguson plays it is so incredible. She does so well at it. She really is like this emotional core of the movie. And I don't know, the dynamic between the three of them, especially between her and him, is such a cool thing. I really do enjoy the relationships between the characters Mm -hmm. in that way. So in the middle of this fucking huge sci-fi epic, I think that that's kind of an essential part of why I love this movie so much. Yeah. Never mind the fact that, you know, as a Persian, um, it's cool to see the whole idea of, you know, Middle Eastern, Middle Eastern space jihad against imperialist fucking, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's it'd be, be done so well. I guess people that look like me, I get it. <laughs> hey, the moral of the story is you can come join us as we take down the, the evil empire. Um, all right. But yeah, no, Dune just, I saw it 12 times in theaters. That really should be in two months. That really should be all anyone needs to know. All right. <clears throat> now we're in the stage of my list uh, where every one that's on here is on here for what I will acknowledge is a deeply personal reason. Shit, I spent 30 hours watching Doom. <laughs> wow, way to detract from what I was saying. Sorry, <laughs> no, I liked it. Well, I mean, this was deeply personal too. We're at the deeply personal part of the list, I think. That's true, that's very true. Yeah. Um, but like, the reason this one made my number three uh, is because this film helped me process trauma uh, in therapy. So I, I can legitimately thank this movie for some personal self-growth right on uh so my number three is writers of justice right on um and this is a movie like it hit me when i first watched it and then i kind of watched it again when it came out well and like on my own when i was trying to process just a lot of heavy shit because and you you know this too you're in therapy there's a part when you kind of start to realize how much trauma you've experienced uh, in your past for the first time. You start recontextualizing basically your entire life. The shit you've been holding off for masculinity's sake or whatever. Well, masculinity's sake is like shit you weren't even aware of. Stuff like you just grew up with. You thought that was normal. Yeah, stuff you thought was fine. Yeah. Uh, no, I like, and I remember because I, I think this happened around the time George died, who was uh, this this yep. older man in my life uh, who like who decided, decided he was going to bully me like for a good five, ten years of my life. Yeah. Uh, like 40 year old pick, picking on a teenager um, and then he passed away earlier this year and was left with really conflicted emotions on top of that trying to process like the trauma from my last relationship and my continuing conflicts with my, my, my family and all these different things and uh, I rewatched that scene the one I've told uh, the one I emphasized because that, that scene means a lot to me hmm. um, and for those who don't have context there's just a scene where like this presser guy looks at this while after he kind of inadvertently caused uh, the death of Matt Nicholson's wife and um, and his daughter, and the daughter has been trying to rationalize it, it has this gigantic wall of like inner. Well, you, 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 sorry to the, you, just for those who haven't seen the movie, you said that a little confusingly. I the professor know. didn't cause the death of the wife and the daughter. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, it's long. Long story short, is the professor feels guilty for something he did that inadvertently caused the death of Matt Meagleson's wife. Led to the death. Yeah, yeah led to the, uh, leaving Matt Meagleson and his daughter alone. Mm. Um, Matt Meagleson is this tough, rah, rah soldier. He doesn't process things well. That becomes an issue later. That, that also weirdly helpful for me too. But mm. the part that I always, like, I think the second time I watched this, I just had a, I had a breakdown. Like, I just broke down into tears. Um, which is not the first time I'll say that in the next few films. <laughs> um... And the part, the part where he's kind of looking there, he's talking about his theory about everything's connected, and he starts like everything leads to everything. Basically, nothing. There's no reason such as coincidence. Everything can be tied back to some other event. Um, but he just kind of makes this point of saying like, but you can go back further and further and further. It was really like there's so much data you can build entirely new systems. You you would never be able to process all that. It's just not physically possible. It's too much of it. Um, it's like it's a waste of time um and then the part is like oh, what was, i can't remember the exact quote but something to the extent in, of uh, in the end it won't change it's it's more like 
uh, what happened? Also, well, she says like, I know I'm, I was trying to find some reason for it, but there is no reason. And he goes like, that's not true. There are centillion really reasons. None of them will help you. Mm. Yeah. And that's the part that even now talking about that uh, kind of chokes me up because like for me, that was a very important revelation as an overthinker yeah um, and as someone who just tries <clears throat> tries to find meaning in everything because if we like a high meaning something that gives mm-hmm. a purpose but sometimes like that you just can't do that hmm? um, um there's something i've been taking a dpt course this past half year and it's taught me some really useful skills that i've actually been passing on to some other people in my life um including my father Um, but one of the biggest things, uh, throughout my life, there've been a lot of people that have mistreated me that I've defended because, you know, they had been through their own bad stuff and they were hurting and, you know, uh, other people wouldn't understand, uh, you know, if I stuck with them, they would eventually get better and that kind of stuff. And I have wasted so, so many years of my life on those relationships like seriously over half of my life is gone because of those people um because i stuck by those people and one of the things that i learned in dbt which was such a useful thing which i wish i'd learned earlier um but maybe i wouldn't have actually learned it properly earlier maybe i had to get to this point in my life to properly learn it but it's that no matter what people do no matter what reasons they have for doing it in the end the effect that it has on you is the effect that it has on you and if it's something that's hurting you if it's something that's harming you you have to address that and if it doesn't stop and it doesn't change then you have to do something about it you have to you know change your environment you have to get away from them because in the end the effect they, they have on you is still what it is whatever the reasons are behind it. It's not exactly the same thing, but I feel like it's adjacent. It is. I think so. So, And just to me, that was, I think, something I really need to not like understand, I think, which helps me let go of the need to understand all the other pieces that I'll never get answers to. Yeah. And why, and why certain people are the way they are and recognizing that it's, it does whatever it is it doesn't ultimately matter what matters is the moment i guess um what matters is who you have around you now and what what they can bring for you and i'm still struggling with that i still have a lot i still have a lot i still need to process through but for me i think it was very helpful to recontextualize a lot of things and learn to let go of my need to rationalize everything to find some kind of answer because that's just how i taught myself to survive especially in my teenage years yeah um that hell that's the reason i got like, like that's why i'm good at reading people is why i got my degree in psychology and all those things i told myself if i understood how people think and how they work and what they did then i can see the hurt coming like i could use as a predictor uh, but of course it's not how reality actually works um so I guess um, for all this, without going too much into all that, I think, uh, yeah, this movie was very weirdly helpful um, in my personal journey. And every time I watch it, I still kind of get like a little choked up. So yeah, Riders of Justice. Um, everything it did up to that point was like the perfect buildup. It really made it sink in. Um, and the way everyone reacted to it almost as violently as they did. <laughs> Um, I also think was is very important is like just how difficult it is to accept that. Yeah. And yeah, for the, all those reasons, yeah, that right is just my number three. Yeah, I it, like when I when I was talking about the father, I was like, I think I would move it a couple more steps up. But then when I talked about the other ones after, and I'm like, no, there's a reason I put it after. Like I put a lot of fucking thought into the sequencing of these. Yeah, me too. And yeah, there's a reason Writers of Justice was higher than the father for me because it did resonate in that deeper way. Um, and it did have that kind of lasting emotional lesson. Yeah. And um, it sticks with you. <laughs> yeah. I don't think there was much of a lesson from of the father. There was just like empathy for something really fucked up. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Because I, I, I can say there's, there's some emotional lessons, so to speak. Sure. In an indirect way. Uh, All right. 
Um, so are you good to move on? You're number two. Yeah. All right. My number two is Titan. Okay. Not your number one. Okay. Um, I'm curious about what your number one is. Cause I'm wondering if we have the same one. We might. Uh, um, but Titan, um, my two times watching Titan were drastically different experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't want to spoil the movie for anyone who hasn't seen it yet. So this will be kind of tricky, but uh, the first time I watched it, I had no idea what was going to happen. Yeah. I hadn't, there were, there are several really volatile elements introduced in the film throughout it. And um, I, I, I just had this really weird experience where I had no idea what was going to happen at any turn of the movie. And I, I love it when a movie does that to me. Yeah. Um, once again, this is one of those movies where I've never seen anything quite like it. Oh, um, I feel like weirdly, I feel like I can say that about the night house. I can say that about Benedetta. I can say that about the father. I can, uh, I, I can weirdly kind of say that about Writers of Justice. Writers of Justice feels like a lot of other movies, but somehow is its own weird, unique thing in the middle of it. Well, because like it, it's like it pretends to be other genres, and then very comes yeah. like its own thing within that genre. Yeah, so it does something really neat with that. Um, but then Titan is absolutely this fucking weirdo movie oh, yeah. um, that is unpredictable and fucked up and strange. And really off-putting, like aggressively in some ways, and in other ways, really fucking funny. <laughs> like at points, it has some really weirdly darkly funny moments, um, and it feels like a fever dream. Yeah. Um, sure. But then that's the thing. It's um, <sighs> that unpredictability is part of why I feel the need to avoid any kind of spoiler as much as I can, because um, the first time you watch it, that unpredictability is a really, really big part of the experience of the movie. But then the second time you watch it, which is what I like the experience I had, um, I can't go too deep into it, but the, Knowing what the movie is about, knowing what's going to happen, knowing what to expect and what not to expect. You are no longer dealing with a kind of sense of suspense at all because you know what's going to happen and what's not going to happen. That unpredictability of the first round is no longer there. And in that loss of the unknown, you are able to focus on the sheer fucking humanity within this movie. Um, And I wrote a really passionate, intense review of this movie. Um, Not really intense even, but just I felt it really deeply. And um, where is it? Um, I wrote this movie tore my heart open and crawled inside. And there's so many things within it that are addressed by in really weird ways. There's a, there's a lot of weird metaphors running throughout the movie, but they're also used as a framework to explore like tenderness and love and care and trust and familial bonds. And, um, just caring about somebody. Yeah. And there's one part of the movie, like the whole movie is essentially like, it has a cool soundtrack and everything, but there's one track in the middle of the movie that comes at a really important point. Mm-hmm. And that song within the context of the second viewing of the movie brought me to fucking tears. <laughs> and 
it's the way the music itself and the scene itself and what it is and what it represents and the lyrics just are very perfectly in sync with each other. And just to give you an idea, I'm just going to read a couple of lyrics right here because I got them pulled up. Um, the song is Lighthouse by Future Islands. Okay. And, you know, they repeat as they go. But uh, So I'm just going to pull a couple of things from it. Um, it says, when I couldn't see you for the wall, what was that you said? Um, and when I couldn't catch you for the fall, what was that you said? Nothing hurts this much. But I've seen the way that bodies lie and bodies tend to break. And I've been away too long to be afraid. But you know, what you know is better, is brighter. And this is where we were when I showed you the dark inside of me, in spite of me, on a bench in the park. And you said, this is not you. Like. Fuck. Yeah, it's yeah. I feel um, where it comes up in the movie is like this. the The actual song itself is so achingly vulnerable and beautiful, yeah. and kind of exuberant in its own way. And its placing in the movie, where it is in the movie, is such an important moment for both of the characters, and it just elevates it perfectly and the second time i watched this movie i cried so much yeah i cried for a good portion of the movie i don't know that i cried harder than i've cried at any movie but i cried more than i've cried at most movies yeah. um just more consistently throughout it, whether it was actually like sobbing or just quietly tears coming out, yeah. there was such an incredible tenderness and beauty at the heart of this movie that I really don't think reveals itself until at least the second viewing. Yeah. And it just meant a lot to me. Absolutely. Um, whether you're going through some kind of gender thing which is deeply woven into this film, or you're just going through or have gone through just a general sense of isolation and a feeling about, you know, any feelings about your actual family versus your found family. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, it encapsulates so much of that emotion and that pain and that, that tenderness within this movie and i just it 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 really really touched me very very deeply and i can't think of a lot of movies in my life that have hit me the way that this movie did on the second viewing yeah. so 100 percent, this is tip top it was my number one for a good while so yeah i'm starting to suspect more what your number one is i'll be very curious if i'm right all right. What's your uh, number two? My number two, I cheated. Um, did you put a tie? I did. You son of a bitch. <laughs> it's my list. I'll do what I want. Uh, Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> I allow myself one per list. Uh, so I put the father and no man land together. Okay. Uh, oh, that makes sense. Okay. Because I, I, I put them together because they, they both invoked very similar emotional reactions and emotional lessons in very different ways. Yeah. Um, I, and this is something we talked about in our father review. So I don't want to regurgitate too much of what I said there, but anyone God knows it's not, it's the most open secret I have of my relation, my change relation, my father over the past couple of years. Um, and this movie came out around the time where, and it's even more relevant of what's, you know, the context of what's going on right now. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it hits a different layer there, but I think what the father did for me was exactly what you said. It portrays, it, it gives the portrait of a deeply <laughs> unlikable man, an unlikable parent, an unlikable human being who just does and says awful things strictly to hurt the one closest to them. Um, and strictly because they they think they're conspiring against them or all these things that are very self-indulgent and all the things are just narcissistic and selfish and cruel. And yet through that, through all that cruelty, 
it presents you with a fate worse than death. And in doing so, for kind of forces you to see the humanity within that cruelty in a way that you don't need to be a part of, but you can still recognize as human. <clears throat> and I think that is, especially as my parents are getting older and things are getting more complicated. Um, I think that is a very important thing for me to keep in mind because it is very easy to lose sight of that, mm -hmm. especially when you're someone like me who just gets so angry. Um, and, uh, and for me, it almost feels like preparation in a way mm. because like, yeah. it's like, this is a situation I know I'm going to have to address. Yeah at some point down the line. And I want to be able to handle it with not necessarily grace, but a healthy understanding that's not rooted in resentment. Yeah. And I think a big part of that is recognizing that as much as you may, you could hate them, angry at them if you can never forgive them you don't have to let any of that stuff go but at the end of the day you do have to re recognize that they are still human and capable of feeling cruel pain in kind yeah so that's that's why the father is still and like I it's one of those movies I watched once I will never watch it again yeah <laughs> Um, um, and I don't need to because I still remember pretty well, and it's been over a year now. Um, it's a deeply empathetic and upsetting experience. And for someone like me who's naturally deeply empathetic, yeah, yeah, that shit still sticks with me. Um, and Nomadland in a similar way, but for different reasons. Um, yeah. Nomadland doesn't necessarily have <clears throat> that kind of harsh cruelty of emotion, but it does present a different, more it does follow a similar level of introspection. I feel in, but it's more meditative. It's more about finding peace within the moment. It's almost like the other side of the coin. Um, it's about letting go of those things that keep you grounded in a past that doesn't serve you anymore. It's about finding a new way forward and finding a new, a new path forward, whatever that means for you. And mm -hmm. not like not needing to conform to what society expects to you, from you to find that. Mm -hmm. Um, and finding peace and community in this offbeat life and how other people have kind of found those same things, how they've used their lifestyle to find their own peace and come to terms with their own hardships and traumas and how all of it kind of revolves around this notion of I'm trying to think of the best way to, best way to phrase it. finding ways to move on with your life on your own terms. Not so letting in, people in a weird way they kind of complicate each other. Like. Was that? Not letting other people tell you what that should look like. I, I don't even want to phrase it that way because that feels that almost feels kind of resentful because I don't think that's what the purpose is. It's not uh, the purpose, but there's definitely a point in the movie where there are people who try to judge her or try to give her an alternate path out of this lifestyle and she very decisively decides That's like, true. no, these people don't understand. There's yeah. a deeper reason to why she's doing this. Um, I think, well, I think it's about, yeah, no, I mean, you're right. I just, I think I phrase it more as of an independent, like choosing independence over expectation. Mm. Okay. And, but that whatever the term independent means going to change different person to person. Not everyone's going to understand or agree with those choices, but it's still yours to make. It's your life to move on from. Mm. Mm -hmm. And, and I think in a weird way, those movies kind of complement each other in, in like in that perspective. We kind of laid out a lot like that. Um, and I found both of those experiences deeply moving and deeply fascinating. I feel like I, it's they've both sat with me this long. Mm -hmm. We saw them around these both around the same time. Yeah. Um, so I think I think for that reason, like they both deserve the number two spot. And I just couldn't choose between them. All right. Fair enough. So number one, I'm very curious. <laughs> Me too. Go ahead. 
number one movie for the year is Nine Days. That's mine too. Yeah. Fuck yes. <laughs> <laughs> that timer right now. <laughs> um that's crazy yeah. considering like considering how much of a struggle i know both of us had putting this list together like, and like the the weird disparities between what we valued yeah. i think it really does say something that in the end both of us decided that by all measurements nine days deserve to be at the top nine days of all the serious movies on this list is the only one I've actively gone back and re-examined. Like I waited for the day this came out on, <laughs> like came out on streaming to watch it again. Yeah. I rewatched it like a couple weeks ago. Yeah. I want like when I was on vacation, when I went to that cabin in the middle of nowhere, like this is what I picked to watch while I was there. Nice. Um, and I'm going to tell you, like kind of like you're saying about Titan, that second experience was kind of a different beast altogether. Yeah. Because I, yeah. this is one of those weird cases. We originally planning to go see this together, and then you had to drop out the last minute. And I was already sitting down. It's so like, all right, I might as well sit through. I might as well sit down and watch this. And I'm glad we didn't see it together. Honestly, yeah, same. Um, I remember I, I agreed with you on that when I went and saw it. Um, because I was kind of like, I need to, I need to sit on this. Yeah, for a while. And you kind of, you had the same thought. Um, and like, I, it is one of those means that just kept nagging me in the back of my brain. Like I kind of became obsessed with it. Yeah. Um, and I was thinking like this, like there's something so deeply human about it. So deeply, like it, it, it does feel like empathy in this most, in almost like a pure form um, and understanding and what it means to be alive. And uh, when I watched it again, the second time when I'm again, I'm, I'm by myself in the middle of fucking nowhere. Um in like in this pure like wilderness setting you can go outside in the middle of the night you go outside it's like like a blanket of stars it was gorgeous um but going there and i've had a couple drinks uh (laughs) and i got i i can't i don't remember what part broke me but there was a part where i just had a complete emotional breakdown (laughs) bike no i don't think it was the bike i think it's when uh it was when I think it was when he was like screaming about the, in the uh, file cabinet. Oh yeah. Um, no, I, I don't even think it was that. I, I it was something like some small little line or something like just broke me, hit me the right way, and I just sobbed. There's um, there's some really great moments. There are multiple great moments that that could be. Yeah, it, it's hard to pick just one, but I'll ask you once we stop filming because this is one of those things that should be preserved for anybody who hasn't seen it Um, but yeah i um the the fact that the the things that this movie touches on are kind of astonishing yep um the way that it explores the concept of what is a life well lived. Yeah. Um, The way that it quietly does the sci-fi of the movie. Mm -hmm. um, This is my favorite kind of sci-fi where the science fiction is kind of off screen Mm -hmm. Um, in a weird way. Like it's also the kind of thing that I loved about a completely different kind of movie under the skin Yeah, where the sci-fi is definitely an element of it, but it is mostly not in your face. Yeah. Um, there is, uh, I love it when science fiction is used to explore a concept and not just focus on like space technology. Um, and in a way this could be just as much be categorized just as much of a fantasy as it could as a science fiction movie. Yeah. Um, but the way that it portrays the concept of, you know, whatever this realm is, the idea of souls um, and the idea of what comes after uh, the whole idea of the judgment process and all of that. And essentially, again, what, what, um, what is a white life well lived yeah. and what is the best way for a person to live their life? Is it, you know, vulnerability versus strength or, you know, what are they going to focus on that makes them a worthy candidate? 
And in the end, at the heart of it, for me, it felt like a lot of what this movie was discussing was an exploration of parenthood. Um, and the idea of, huh? I, I, I can see that. The, the idea of, you know, how do we raise our children? How do we, what, what values do we instill in them to focus on, to, to, you know, get through life and survive life and enjoy life. And in the end, how much of that is passed on from our own trauma that we haven't resolved, yeah. what we're afraid of, what we don't want them to experience in their life, you know? And, um, one of the big things about this movie was when I rewatched it recently with my father, um, I looked up some stuff about the director mm. and uh, it's not, you know, he's, he's, he's in America. He lives in LA, you know, um, he moved to LA to go to film school, but before that he um, grew up in Sao Paulo, Brazil. He's half Brazilian, half Japanese, I believe. Oh, okay. um, and so I, that's one of the things like, this is the kind of shit that you get from people that are rooted in other cultures where they have a little more of a different take on spirituality and stuff than your average American. Um, but at the same time, one of the things about this movie that I really appreciated, especially the second time through became a lot more clear um, when I read about him a little bit. And when he was a kid, the whole reason that this is his debut feature is that when he was a kid, his uncle killed himself. Mm -hmm. And what he remembered was that after that happened, that was all that anyone remembered about his uncle. It was what defined him as a person. Um, it was basically the story, the legacy that was left behind. And there was just so much more to him as a person. And he hated the notion that people would uh, reduce his life to the idea that because he killed himself, he must not have had a good life yeah, um, or a life worth living. Like it was a waste or something like that. And while this movie explores a lot more than just that concept the fact that that concept is such a central theme within this, I think is really powerful and really beautiful. And it's not really something that you see explored in films in a way that is as eloquent and sensitive as this is. But even with all of these themes within that is just this really sublime depiction of the little things that make day-to-day -day life so amazing yeah. and wonderful. Like if you watch this movie and say you watch this movie in the spring within the next few months and immediately after watching this movie, you go for a walk in the woods. Yep you will have a completely fucking amazing experience. <laughs> like you will totally appreciate all the little things like Absolutely. the sunlight trickling through the, the leaves above you or the crunch of the, the, the dirt underneath your feet or the texture of bark underneath your fingers when you touch a tree, you know, like just things like that. Yeah. This movie kind of reminds you of, of that stuff. Or and did, which is watch the movie, then go stand outside in the cold. That sounds and awesome. Like, like look at a blanket of star. Like turn off all the lights in the house and let's look at a blanket of stars. Dude, that sounds amazing. Amazing experience. I love yeah, it. dude. So yeah, that's um, this movie accomplishes so much, and at the same time as it is a meditation on all of these things, in the end, it's also an affirmation. And it is a beautiful, heartfelt, um, just depiction of life, 
just yeah. an affirmation of life. And however tough things may be or not be, there's still things about life that make it beautiful and worth living and enjoyable and nice. You know, like there's just, there's so much to that. I really, is, really appreciate what this fucking movie did. This movie is brimming with humanity yeah. in every port, every big and small experience. And it is embedded in every frame and every set piece and every, like this is an actor's film. Like all the actors do an amazing job. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and every, every, like, even like when they're t- sitting around the table, they're telling like the little stories that they see from people and how, like how much those little stories mean the world to them. Mm-hmm. And it just goes to show like, there is no such thing as too small of a moment in life. Everything can mean something to someone and it's okay to wear that vulnerability out loud. It's okay to express that. It's okay to, live that moment in the way it's meant to be lived there's no shame in expressing the joy and sadness and pain that life has to offer you don't need to be tough to get the most out of life in fact doing so means you get to enjoy life less even if that means you're more likely to get hurt as a result and that is the kind of lesson that i want to see more of and i wish that was taught more and it's not in a movie that is so open about that and unabashedly open about that is something that touches me very, in a very, very personal place. Um, and yeah, like it is a movie. I, if I, if I need a good cry, I will put that movie on. <laughs> yeah. Um, not even like, not even like sad tears. Like just, no, it's a good cry. It's a good cry. It's like legitimately a good cry. Like you're sitting yeah. there, and you're watching these um, beautiful moments, and then the very next moment is just heartbreaking, and you have all like this gambit of just oh my emotions, uh, yeah. going through this all the time. And it's one of those it's one of those niche films I have to like bully people into watching, basically. Because like, yeah. ne- I know it sounds like a total pretentious douchebag film, but I promise you, it's worth it. Uh, this is the thing. Like, if this movie didn't pull it off as well as it does, it, it would absolutely be a pretentious douchebag film. And a lot of people could definitely argue that it still is, definitely. Yeah. Um, but you know what? Those people definitely um I feel like they got raised to be a little too tough. I think this movie is a direct rebuke against cynicism and nihilism as a concept. Yeah. And showing like, no, that's not the path to life. This yeah. is something deeply beautiful about this whole movie. And I, I um, want so badly to become for that to become a more prevailing narrative. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, there's just something really special about this. And I still remember even in the first couple of minutes of the movie um, during the violin solo. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like I was sitting there on the couch with my dad and even with just the stuff that was coming on screen when it's just a bunch of random clips with this music over it and you still don't quite know what's going on. Like I was just sitting there smiling at just how gorgeous this combination of imagery and sound was. And I just turned to my dad and I just said, isn't music and he just said, amazing. <laughs> like, he literally finished my sentence exactly. That's beautiful. And within the first few seconds of the movie, he immediately understood how special it was yeah. and why I was making him watch it. And afterwards, he absolutely adored it. Like, he loved it. Yeah. He's like, this is, this is that special kind of movie. Like Absolutely. he's going to buy it. He wants to buy it. And you know um, it's going to get snubbed in the Oscars. I'm already pissed about that. Oh, of course. But fuck the Oscars. It's like the fuck Grammys. Who cares? Yeah, right. Um, it's cool when something unexpected and deserving actually wins, but most of the time it's not. So, um, but like the only negative I can say about this is that it's this director's first ever movie. And that infuriates me on a personal level. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like, how do you come out the gate this fucking strong, dude? Like, like your first movie should not be this fucking good. That breaks all the laws of art. Your first day is supposed to be crap. And we all know it. <laughs> right. You fucking talented, beautiful person. <laughs> I mean, the last things I could say that about were both horror movies. So like, <laughs> 
fucking uh, Hereditary and The Witch. <laughs> like, okay, fair. Yeah, those were both standout fucking debuts, and um, definitely uh, not nearly this kind of thing. No, this is this is person. another level. This is a level of empathy and compassion in film that you just don't see very often. Yeah, and you to- it's it it makes you feel more understood in a weird way after mm-hmm. watching it. No, it's um you can tell when someone emotionally who is emotionally developed to a certain extent writes something that is very deeply felt for them. Yeah. And this clearly meant a lot to Edson Oda and I'm so happy that he was able to execute on this level and get such an amazing cast to help him achieve this vision. Yeah. And it just the way it all comes together wouldn't change a thing. Mm-hmm. I'm so fucking happy that we both just arrived at this one as Me our movie too. of the year. That's really great. <laughs> I love that. Like, I'm so happy this is both our number ones. <laughs> yeah. No, that, uh, that, that, that means a lot to me. That's pretty cool. Okay. Yeah, so that's... Nine days, 100%, 10 out of 10 movie. Just fantastic. Adored it. I will definitely, it is the only one in the top five that I'll probably watch at least four times. Uh, so this is definitely going, uh, this is one of those things where I'm like, I'm going to buy this on digital and Blu ray. This goes on the physical shelf. Like it takes special movies to be on my physical shelf. And this definitely belongs on there. This will go like in rotation with like the Mr. Rogers documentary of like, oh, do I need a good oh. ride tonight? Like, yeah. All right. So that was 2021. We and did with it. that, yeah, that's the best of 2021. Whew, season nine is officially over. Now we're on season 10. We've been doing this for 10 fucking years now. Hot damn. Damn. Um, have I been here for like eight or nine of them? At least, like, like I would the... say, like eight or so. Wait, wait. I have to. I know which movie it was too. Do you really? Yep, I remember. Better memory than I do. <sighs> no, I remember because it was so bad. <laughs> 2014. There we go. Yeah, this is the eighth year. Do you do you remember our first movie together? I don't. What was it? <laughs> Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Was it fucking really? <laughs> that really awful fucking live action one that was directed oh by the God. same guy who directed Battle for L.A. Was it? Oh, my God. It was. <laughs> <laughs> and then the Duke, I think, was the second one. So, Bob yeah. It was a memorable experience. I still remember that one. Definitely 2014 um, was when I got started on this. But yeah, what a way we came along. <laughs> yeah, fucking hell. I just clicked on the bottom of Baba Duke and unletterboxed one of the one of the one of the reviews from someone I follow. It was just, I don't remember Monsters Inc. being this fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> um God, so many memories. We're so yeah. young. All right. Oh, well, thank you guys for joining us through that little odyssey. That was a long night. Thank you all for watching. Stay tuned for the review scream eventually. Bye. Yep. Bye. <laughs>